Welcome, everybody, to Dead Talk Live. And tonight, we have a very special guest, Patrick Lussier, uh, renowned editor, director, writer. Patrick, thank you so much for being here with us. How are you doing? Great, great. It's a great pleasure to be with you. Thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, absolutely. It is our honor to have you. And I want to get started right away with the uh, the editing portion of your career, which is extensive. Mm. You, from what I can tell, have been editing since like the late 80s, early 90s. So you have seen yeah. the advancement of technology all the way to where it is today with editing. Uh, you know, how do you feel on how far things have come in the last, you know, 30 years in regards to uh, motion picture, television editing, and the technology that's out there? Uh, I mean, it's huge leaps and bounds. I, I came in uh, just at the tail end of film, although I was never paid to cut film. Um, and film lasted for a number of years afterwards, people still editing on film. So, you know, celluloid mm -hmm, strips, 35 mm -hmm. millimeter, 24 frames per second, uh, where all that information comes from. Um, and, uh, but we cut initially on a thing called a montage, which was a 17 beta max, not beta cam, beta max drives that would shuttle and queue up and try and queue up sections of of a show to play. So I started on the, on the hitchhiker, uh, which was one of the very first HBO quote unquote dramas. Yeah. It was basically sort of a horror thriller. Yuppies run amok. Um, 1986, 1985. And I guess they went on to about, you know, 1990 and it was their last season, but it was, you know, it was always how much, uh, gratuitous, uh, violence and nudity can you pack into 22 minutes? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, and HBO, of course, has changed a lot since then, oh, yeah. um, or not at all. <laughs> um, but, you know, they had great directors and stuff. Philip Noyce had directed uh, episodes, and, and uh, Colin Butsy, who's a big TV director, uh, had directed episodes. And, you know, they had all sorts of different types of time. So, so as, um, as the technology evolved in the 90s into the 2000s into what it is mm. today, did you find yourself learning on the job? Uh how did you find adjusting from how things were done to how things are done today? Yeah, it's, it's, um, you know, on, on one hand, it's a lot different. On the other hand, it's, 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 you know, uh, an editing system, whether it's the montage or the Ediflex or film or the avid or, or final cut when that had its, you know, moments in the sun or, or whatever is, uh, uh, the, you know, whatever you're cutting on now on your phone or whatever it's they're all just hammers um you know they're just a tool uh how you use it is how you use it um so yeah i learned new equipment on the job and and different equipment had different things that it was good at it, they each one sort of allowed you to do different things in a certain way um but at the end of the day, the the story and the drama and the, and the uh, what's in front of you is what dictates everything. Exactly. Um, you know, I yeah, I, I learned early on from a couple of different editors, uh, uh, Michael Robeson and, and Mike Elliott, uh, that you know the philosophy of you cut with your gut, not your head. Yeah. Um, you know, you have to feel everything you edit. So you, you know, if it's a, if it's a scary scene, you have to be editing on the edge of your seat. If it's a romantic scene, you have to be, you know, willing to be on the verge of tears or whatever, you know, you, you have to be the, the, the third party in the scene mm -hmm. in order for them to work. Absolutely. Now, as, as a video editor you, in post-production, you, uh, you work with the director very closely, I assume. Mm -hmm producers, the sound people. Uh, how much autonomy does a video editor have uh, when it comes to films? It, does it vary depending on the project? Yeah, it, it uh, varies completely. Uh, and, and the director, uh, usually. You know, it's the amount of trust the director has. You know, with Wes Craven, he and I ended up with a really great shorthand. So I would handle... Uh, you know, a lot of the the day to day with composers and, and with visual effects and with uh, um, 
uh, the sound and everything like that. He would always have specific things at spotting sessions so that I would oversee all the everything until it got it got to the stage, and then Wes would come in and and do all the final things. Um, but he gave me a lot of uh creative input which allowed me when i made the switch into directing uh you know is an amazing way to learn because he was always there to sort of also you know pull back on the reins oh and a little less this a little more that and, and had you know he was a great mentor and teacher as well as uh, somebody who gave you a, a lot of trust to collaborate now you and Wes have worked on a lot of projects together. Would you call mm-hmm. you guys? You know, were you guys good friends? Yeah, I think so. I think you know, in as I went on to direct afterwards, certainly from Valentine on, we sort of uh, drifted apart a bit in the last few years of his life. Unfortunately, just because I got busy doing other things and he was busy doing other things, and it was just one of those things that we weren't in the same place or in the same time. And, yeah. and, and, you know, you'd reach out at birthdays and Christmas and different times like that. And, and, uh, but certainly when we were in the height of working together, we would, you know, spend a lot of time together and, and, uh, um, you know, we would travel here, there and everywhere to, you know, to New York or to wherever, you know, we were previewing or all those different things as they, uh, as the journeys required. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, you, you couldn't really help but be close just because um, this these were the people you saw every day. Uh, exactly. You know, Wes and you know Wes and, and Dan Arredondo and Tina Anderson, the two post people who who worked with us and and, uh, um, and who were always right there all through production and, and Marianne Madalena, the producer and stuff. You know, it was you know we were all sort of thick as thieves for a time, and then when as each of us sort of began to branch out and do other things. You know, it's just like life. You begin to sort of drift apart and exactly. then come back together. And then suddenly it's like, oh, you know, it's it. you you wish you could buy back all the, uh, you know, all the time you were apart to spend together just because you, you know, you realize that suddenly one of you is gone and or two of you are gone. And, yeah. and it's just like, oh, crap. It's, yeah. How did that happen? It's sad. Now, in 2000, mm-hmm. you made the jump from the post-production editing mm. room to being behind the camera as a director with <laughs> Prophecy 3 and the very successful D- Dracula 2000. How did you go from editor to director? How did that all play out? Uh, you know, I had uh, started doing a little bit of directing on MacGyver, the original MacGyver series back in the 80s, um, I, uh, where I started editing. I had done some inserts. MacGyver used to be eight days of main unit photography, two days of second unit photography that didn't have Rich Dean Anderson, but was still basically main unit, and then three days of inserts for all the MacGyverisms. So I remember starting on a couple episodes of that, you know, like trying to make a, a bulldog, uh, Winston the bulldog, who was in stakeout with Richard Dreyfus and, uh, and <laughs> Estevez, disarm a bomb. Winston did not disarm bombs. It wasn't any really on his on his CV. So that was a little harder than one expected. <laughs> And then I had to do another one where I had to disarm a bomb with a feather. That seemed to be the thing I, I got to do in the early days. Um, and then I did a few, you know, inserts, little second uni things for Wes along the way on, on a little bit on Vampire in Brooklyn, a little bit on, on Scream 2 and Scream 3. Um, and then uh, Dimension offered me the chance um uh, when i went on to do to edit halloween h2o mm-hmm. i ended up um supervising all the posts of that because steve minor uh had a uh another job he was going off to direct lake placid so he finished shooting very quickly he went up to direct lake placid and came down only for a couple of days to mix and, and the director's cut was very quick it was like mm-hmm. a day and a half so i oversaw a lot of the post of that and as that you know, as part of the quote unquote reward for that, they said, we'll kick your ass uh, if you want to direct for us. <laughs> um, so Prophecy came up and, and it was a great chance to work with Joel Swasson. And we had, you know, Christopher Walken for seven days. And we had a we had a pretty interesting script, um, I thought, and uh, and managed to um, like a few weeks up from production. The, there was a note from Dimension Films, this, you know, this character that had one line. Suddenly they wanted to make her the lead in the story. Um, the character that was the hero, they wanted to make the villain. Um, the whole sort of ending and, and 
B storyline that ran through it suddenly was completely different. But, you know, as, as Joel said, you have to love every mutant child as you go forward. <laughs> so we did the best we could in, in, in what we wanted. It was a lot of fun. You know, we, it, Bono was great. Brad Dourif was great. And it worked yeah. out. And uh, yeah. so by the time it came and you really, you know, took the reins of a director, you it would be fair to say that you felt very comfortable uh, being behind the camera. Uh, yeah. I, I com- well, comfortable is around, you know, I, I just finished directing something like last week. And, and, and I, w- I will tell you, you're never really comfortable. You get more confident. And, and, and I find every morning you start with a vague feeling of absolute terror <laughs> that until you start seeing it and then you block it once and you see it and you see the actors do it. You're like, okay, well, okay, this will work. I won't get fired today. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, you know, you, you, uh, I, I think the, the fear of failure is a good thing. Yeah. Uh, you know, the fear, fear of, 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 one wanting to do better every time and wanting to find new ways to do things and in the different parameters that you have and the dip with the different budgets that you're given. Um, so, uh, yes, I would say more confident, more knowledgeable, but at the same time, it's, it's still every, everything you do is always different and yeah. everything is, is just like, it's an uphill shit fight. So exactly. uh, and it, it keeps you yeah. on your toes. Then that's the whole point. It does. Keep you on your toes. It does. And that is the point. If, if it, if it became, you know, the same thing every day, day in and day out, you, you know, it would be like working in a factory. Now with, uh-huh. when, when it came time for Dracula 2000, that mm. is a, a script that you took part in writing uh what was that mm. like i mean um you know you have several writing credits uh all three mm-hmm. of the dracula movies that you directed and uh, uh wrote so what is it like seeing a project from writing it through the directing experience and having that control um you know it it's it's always you know the first for the first draft you write you try to write it uh, a responsibly to the budget you might have, but they're always generally bigger and more, more robust and have more things. And, and you're not writing them for a specific location. You're writing for them often for the location in your head, which doesn't exist. Um, and then you're suddenly you're faced with the production realities of, Oh, you, you, you mean, you, you mean we can't get a tank? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we, can't do this, we can't do that. And it's like, oh, okay, well let's, let's, you know, and one by one, you sort of start, you know, molding it into what it can be. Um, uh, you know, the most exciting part is is casting. And, and I've, I've never really had a project where this didn't happen, where you started to audition actors and then you rewrote one part specifically based on an audition that completely changed how you saw a character. Wow. Uh, you know, the, the cast or the final stewards and the final owners of the characters. Um, so as such, once you once you hand the characters over to them, you have to have that trust to let them breathe the life into them that 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 you, you know, coach and guide to to the reality. But at the same time, they're the ones who have to walk it. Mm-hmm. You know, they're the ones who have to slip on that skin and make it theirs. So uh, there's yeah, there's been several times where just an actor will do something in an audition that is just like oh my god i did not ever see this that way um you know and it's it's always exciting uh, to witness that and go okay now we have an opportunity to reshape this part to become something else and to become uh, uh, add, and it always makes the characters deeper. Exactly, you and I've, I've heard a lot of directors say seventy percent of directing is casting, and just oh, get out of yeah. their way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you know, the actor who taught me the most about working with actors is Wrecker Howard. Oh, um, you know, we only had him for a few days on Dracula three. Speaking of the hitcher, um, in, you know, in, a, in, 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 yeah, in, yeah, yeah, in Romania. And Rutger was just, um, you know, he was a fascinating guy. He was very thoughtful. He was a real sort of poet. And, and um, you know, he he would 
uh, was he came days early. He he dressed it was just before Christmas. He dressed up as Santa Claus for the crew. He dressed up as Santa Claus and went to orphanages in, in Bucharest. And um, uh, I think he did acting classes uh, for the local drama school at, as as Hamlet as a vampire. Uh, See, that's but, great. You know, you know those, those yeah. are the stories you don't get to hear, and I love hearing that. I have no idea. Yeah. I, I love Rutger Hauer as an actor, you know, and all the yeah. stuff he's done. He, he was just very generous, a very generous soul, and, and, and his advice of, you know, I'd learned a lot from Wes about watching him work with actors, and I'd seen a lot of that firsthand, and um, but Rucker was was like, you know, it's great that you're prepared, but mm-hmm. you you have to trust us to do it. Yeah. Um, and it was it was his advice was positively liberating, liberating. Right. Because suddenly it was like it, it was like this huge weight that you got to share with somebody else as opposed to thinking you had to micromanage every yeah. footfall they made. Um, so I was I was very grateful for that. And I've carried that advice with me since then. That's a great story. Uh, that's a great, great story. Now, one of my favorite projects of yours is Trick. Uh, I love mm. that movie. I really, really love that movie. That's another movie that you wrote as well. Now, yeah, I wrote how, with Todd Farmer. Yeah, yeah, with Todd Farmer. How did you guys come up with the concept of Trick? How did that work? Uh, you know, we had we had talked about um, after Valentine of uh, wanting to do a sequel to Valentine. Um, you know, wanting to step back into sort of the slasher world. Um, we we had sort of there are elements of Trick that would have been elements of the Valentine sequel. Certainly, the the end reveal of Trick uh, was part of what we were originally pitching for Valentine okay. uh, for for how that sequel was going to go and in, in, in what had happened to poor Tom Hattiger in the Nut House. Mm. Um, uh, and uh, and then we'd also talked about wanting to do, um, you know, we had written uh, Halloween 3D. Uh, in 2009 um, ultimately it didn't happen we were like oh. five weeks out from shooting it um, none of that is in uh, is in trick but it was certainly something you know that sort of world we had done a lot of research on and, and had been in, in interested in going back into you know some sort of seasonal venture uh, and and um, uh, and then wanting to do a, a killer that was very young and very fast and very agile and, and sort of a berserker, mm-hmm. um, you know, that the opening sequence of trick sort of set the tone for what that killer would be yeah. um, and how, what, you know, he wasn't a slow sort of stocky, you know, mm-hmm. stocky, like S T A L K E R as opposed to S T, you know, like yeah. stocky. Uh, you know, like like Michael Myers, no matter how fast yeah, you run, like he will you know, go his pace and he will always catch yeah, up to you. And it wasn't like Michael Myers, wasn't like Jason, wasn't, you know, we wanted somebody who was who was incredibly fast and agile um, as, you know, in a contrast. And, and then and then sort of had the, the little twist mystery at the end, which was something that we you know, at one point we thought, is it, you know, is it a really a supernatural story? Is it this? And then Todd and I kept kicking around and, and arrived at the ending that we arrived at because that felt, mm, it felt like it took us outside, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of the other, a lot of the other sort of slasher uh, stories and, you know, gave it its own identity. And that takes me exactly, well, you pretty much answered my next question. I was going to ask you, in your mind, what separates Trick from other Halloween slasher films? So, would you say the killer himself is what separates him from other? Yeah, yeah. I, I I think the killer's agenda is different. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know. I think the 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 troika of heroes we we uh, were very excited by as well to have, you know, each one sort of has their own sort of storyline. You have, uh, Omar Epps Denver, um, you know, is basically the, the beginning and then his story begins to, uh, uh, let go to, um, to Ellen Adair, who plays the sheriff, um, who is, who's very in the middle of the story, who's very much the, um, 
the non-believer. Yeah. Um, and then you have the innocent, who is you know played by Christina Reyes, who's who uh, is the uh, uh, the unwilling final girl who comes in at the end, who has to you know has to be back yeah. in some blood and, mm-hmm. and, and face the facts of you know face her her role in the past events. Um, you know that that part really interested us as well. Um, and you know it was. Uh, originally when we went in the budget was twice as much as 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 we ended up making for and, and of course we we foolishly <laughs> didn't cut the script back as much as we should have so our ambitions were 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 twice as much as as we had but that was you know that's a, that's the way it usually that's is the way just, it works you always you, know, you you try and reach beyond your grasp and 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 hope for the best and do the best with what you have now the yeah, the, absolutely. the killer in uh trick very iconic look with the, mm. the two-faced pumpkin mask and the boogeyman makeup underneath. Was that how you guys wrote it into the script? Or uh, did you kick around a lot of different ideas on what were you going to make it look um, like? The, the the pumpkin mask was something we had in right from the beginning and, and the multiple masks. That was part of the original, the original concept. And then it was with Gary Tunnicliffe, um, who's uh, long been my partner in, in these kind of cinematic crimes <laughs> um, uh, since Dracula 2000. We've worked mm-hmm. together many, many times. And Gary and I were kicking around the masks before, you know, production got, you know, long before the production got going or greenlit. We were just talking about it. And we came up with the two-faced mask, the idea of of turning the mask around and, you know, and sort of that happy, happy, sad sort yeah. of thing. And it, you know, um, I don't know if you remember an old Hammer movie called Vampire Circus. Mm, um, can't say that. There is, yeah, it's an old, I think it's 1972. Um, but in it, there is a clown that has a happy face and then sort of rips it off and has a sad face. It is very disturbing. And that that has always stuck with me. And then when we were kicking around, I thought, well, what if we did something like that? What yeah. if he did that and... And then we, you know, move the map mask around in it. And then in his attack sequences, certainly in the beginning, it's really weird because he looks like he's looking both directions all the time. Yeah. Um, so that was, that was, um, uh, you know, it just arrived at one of those things, right? There's that sort of creative uh, thing where it's you're like, just bouncing ideas back and forth. Suddenly there, suddenly there it is. And what you guys came up with is, like I said, iconic. Now, Jamie Kennedy yeah. and Omar Epps are both Scream alumni. Did you know those guys from previous work experience and brought them uh, in? Yeah, I I had met Jamie uh, several times on Scream and Scream 2. I had not met Omar on Scream 2, but I had worked with Omar on Dracula 2000. So, and always had wanted to work with Omar again. He's you know, a brilliant years. actor. He's a brilliant he, actor. He's great. And and a total pro and very serious about his craft and, and a delight to work with. And we... Um, uh, Carl Dupre, who is one of the writers on Prophecy uh, 3, and I had written something for him specifically a long time ago, um, sort of a, a police ghost story thing that ended up not happening. But but we had written it specifically for Omar and mine after I had worked with him. But uh, totally forgot about that project until you just mentioned it. I, I have to go to that old trunk of script that he has and take it out. I can imagine how much scripts you have somewhere locked away. Uh, now, yes. when you were making Trick, did you try not to fall into any of the Halloween horror movie tropes, uh, try to avoid them in any way? Um, you do both things. You try to avoid some and you lean into others, right? You know, uh, um, it, 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 it's a mix of things. You know, you, there are certain, uh, certain things you can't help but do. So you're like, okay, if we're going to do it, let's just lean all the way in. Yeah. Um, you know, and there's other things where you're like, oh, you know, that's uh, uh, let's sort of <laughs> let's avoid that one. Um, but you know, that's that you sort of do both. You you feel your way through it, and and, um, and it's an ever changing thing, right? The, the you know the original sequence in the church and in, in where they're watching Night of the Living Dead originally was written for a drive-in until two days before we shot it when there was 60 mile an hour winds Ooh. and it was like 20 degrees Fahrenheit. So it was so cold and, and we couldn't shoot there. So, um, 
we had used that church as a base camp two days before. And so the DP, uh, uh, Amanda Trace and I walked in there and said, Hey, uh, maybe we can shoot here. <laughs> and, and within two days, the whole crew, we had found a, you know, inflatable screen that we could put up in the church. And, and it turned out that the, the, one of the people who took care of one of the caretakers of the church was a huge fan of Omar's. Yeah. So that helped. And, and their only thing is, is we, we had to be out by, because uh, we were shot on a Saturday, we had to be out by before ten o'clock service at ten a.m. So all the sort of bodies and everything had to be cleared out. I could see the floor, congregation floor coming church. in and seeing oh. all that. <laughs> that would have been. Oh yeah. Oh my. And, and, and the minister was very. He was. He was very serious about it. it, it he was. Um, I bet. He was his his warning to us that we were very welcome. But uh, he was very stern, so we were we we didn't we didn't want to mess around with that. So we made sure we were up. Now your career being primarily in horror, if uh, what would you say is like the key element in writing a good horror script? We see all these horror movies coming out, and everyone is trying to come up with that unique like six sense idea with Bruce Willis. You know, and yeah. every couple of years we get it. You know, I can name movies like, you know, Paranormal Activity, what the Blair Witch Project mm -hmm. did for found footage, what Eli Roth did with Hostel. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, everybody's trying to find that next great big surprise. Are there any surprises left to be had? What would you say is the biggest secret to Riley to writing a compelling horror thriller script. Um, you know, I think, I think it's really hard to to define because so many, so many things they they what they become. You know, if they if they catch that lightning in a bottle and they mm -hmm. you know they start spreading, um, you don't know they're going to do that. You don't know you're going to no. do. They're going to do that with the make it. So you just have to tell the best story you can. Try to make the, your characters as compelling um, as possible. They don't. Ha they don't have to be likable, but you have to want to watch them. Um, try not to make them dumb. Yes. <laughs> um, um, we don't always succeed with that, but uh, um, it, you know that is a thing that that you. I I know we all. Uh, I certainly fight against it's just like oh what would what would you really do would you really do it you know would yeah. you really say i'll be back would you really go down in that basement i don't think i'd go down in that basement no we'd go running <laughs> um, out the door yeah so you know try try to find that 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 sincere heart to it and and the rest of it will you know i when we we're all making scream. None of us had any idea what that movie was going to be. Mm -mm. Um, uh, I remember Kevin worrying that it might not even be very scary, uh, that we all felt before we previewed it, that it was a mystery that worked, the mystery played. Um, but it wasn't until we saw it with an audience that it was like, Oh, okay. Well, there's something else here that, that we are, that goes beyond us. If you, know, you were we, to ask we, me, yeah, if you yeah. were yeah, go on. Sorry. No, no, no. That, that, that's no, I was going to say, if you were to ask me what is the element in Scream that really makes it so good, I think it would be hard for me to pinpoint it on one particular thing. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I yeah. think it's I, I think it is it's it is so many different things that work in that movie. Um, you know, a lot of different directors on West kept turning that down kept thinking it was more of a comedy than a horror movie. Wes shot that movie straight. Mm -hmm. It was a movie that had Kevin wrote brilliantly and had some really fun and funny moments in it. But Wes shot that as a very brutal straight ahead horror movie. And I'm sure that was um, one of the biggest. That, yeah, I think, I think, you know, it, it, and it was a reaction to so many other things, right? It was a reaction to, uh, I think the the disappointment of of, of uh, Vampire in Brooklyn not being as successful as everybody had hoped, mm -hmm. um, and how that story had been sort of compromised, and and in its own way a little bit bloodless. Yeah. Um, you know, there were early versions of the Vampire in Brooklyn script that were amazing, um, but they were too expensive. 
Yeah. Um, so, you know, the, the ending was originally a fist fight on a, uh, not a fist fight. It was a huge battle on a tanker truck hanging off the side of the, the, the Brooklyn bridge. <laughs> and it ended as a fist fight in an apartment. <laughs> um, oh, so, you know, and so often so many of the scary scenes or dramatic scenes in that movie got replaced by dialogue scenes as because dialogue was cheaper. So the first cut was like 145 minutes of people talking. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. where the scream was lean and, and, and smart and, and subversive and vicious. And, um, and I think Wes really needed that, you know, well, I that, think, that's why scream is called. It's what revitalized his career. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I think it, I think it, it arrived, it was the perfect movie at the perfect time. And exactly. I think, and I don't think any of us including him, knew that at the time it was being made. Mm -hmm. And I don't think you do when you're making it. That's the case most often. You don't know when you're doing it. Now, I I, I got a very uh, specific question for you here. It regards editing. Now, back in the day in the 80s, you can tell what was called back then the B-type movies, not only in horror, but in other genre, Mm -hmm. by the film quality, okay? Now... Mm -hmm. Fast forward to 2021, where, you know, your smartphone can record better quality video than the best cameras can do in the 1980s. Is there Mm -hmm. any excuse, no matter what the budget is for a film, for a movie coming out in today's world to have, unless it's purposely done, to have that very cheap look to it, unless it's purposely being done on, you know, you, you know it's there's is more. To, it's always the thing of there's more to it than the gear, right? If it was just about equipment, then anybody could do anything. Yeah. You just get the equipment, you do it. Um, you know, there, there there is a level of artistry um, and education. Be that you know, uh, via university or college, whatever, or via experience, uh, um, you know, uh, that is, is absolutely vital to something, you know, that looks really good, whether it be recorded on an iPhone, um, or recorded on, you know, some sort of 70 millimeter Christopher Dolan yeah. extravagant, you know, it, it all comes down to, at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter um, about the tools. It's all about your artistry with the tools. Okay. That makes perfect sense. Ha- have yeah. you worked on any modern day projects where the director said, I want to give it a 90s look, uh, filters, maybe a little bit of grain, uh, something like that? They want to give it the older style look? Ah, uh, yeah. I, I mean, it's certainly something that gets, uh, gets talked about. Um, it's often sort of, you know, I've worked with directors of photography who, who've said that to me, ah, uh, you know, and it's, it used to be the whole thing of, A, I want it to look like Blade Runner, then it was, A, I want it to look like Seven. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I needed to be sort of desaturated and this and that and this. And then, you know, and ultimately I think, uh, it's the look that works best for the project, mm-hmm. right? It works best for the story. I think, I think it's the same with the score and with the production design and the costumes. And it's it's all about what works best for the vision of the story and 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 what the characters within the story need to to unleash, you know, the story that they're part of. Okay. Uh, and you know, I think those there's a variety of different ways to do that, and and sure, sometimes it's adding film grain, sometimes it's adding this, sometimes it's adding that, sometimes it's being you know I, I and I've said this story before. I always remember on Red Eye uh, with Wes, you know, at the time when you know, Fast and the Furious and those movies had come mm-hmm. out, where you know you go down the car into the into the engine, out the back, through the tailpipe, out the accelerator, all in one sort of crazy shot. And they asked him if he was going to do any of that on the on, on the plane, and he's like, "No, I'm going to shoot close-ups." <laughs> um, and you know, Red Eye plays certainly for two thirds of it like it was a stage play. Yeah. I mean, it is all performance. It is all you know, and actors are the best visual effect you could ever have. They're the best 
way to capture an audience. Um, you don't need $90 million in your visual effects budget if you have a great actor mm -hmm. who, who can just unleash themselves on your story. Okay. No, I, I agree with that 100%. Now, I read in a previous interview that you did, I believe, that you and Todd, when you were writing Trick, you wanted to pay homage to the old uh, slasher film, but yet also mm. pave the way to uh, a new style of slasher. Do you feel, looking back, you guys accomplished that with Trick? Um, Sure. Uh, you know, I, I, in varying degrees, yes. You know, I think, I think ultimately that's not up for us to even be able to weigh in judgment of. Mm -hmm. You know, that's up to the people who see it to say whether we were successful or not. I, I think, you know, whether we think we were successful at some parts of that and not as successful at other parts, you know, other people may disagree. And, and it's sort of like once you, once you make it, it's no longer yours, right? It's, yeah. it's how, how you see it, how you perceive it, how the audience takes that in, that beca it becomes as much theirs as, as anybody else's. I can tell you the intent may be different than your interpretation. That doesn't necessarily make your interpretation wrong. It's just because that's how, you know, your experience uh, of it. And, and, you know, uh, my, my, my intention of making it, whether I think I succeeded or not, um, you know, you're, you're always, you, you carry around a sack full of compromises that you made when you made it. And it's just like, but I have all these compromises and it was going to be amazing. And now it's just full of tears. <laughs> you toss it to one side. So, you know, divorcing yourself from, from that baggage. So when you ask me, do I feel we succeeded? It's just like, I can't answer that. All right, you're right. You know, uh, the audience and history itself is going to be the judge of that. Yeah. That's, so, that's always the case. So let's talk some more about My Bloody Valentine. Uh, first of all, were you a fan of the original when you took on this I project? I was, yeah. Yeah, I, I had worked at a, at a VHS video store in like 1982 to 83, and then again a little bit in 84. Um, you know, and these were all slasher movies were things I would take, because you could take movies home for free if they hadn't been rented. So, you know, you take home things home with the, mm -hmm. you know, the old VHS tapes, which would wrinkle and chew in your thing. Um, but I had watched a lot of those films and, and Valentine growing up as a kid in Canada, Valentine was certainly one of the, one of the Canadian tax shelter horror movies, you know, like Terror Train and Prom Night and, um. I, you know, I, you speaking know. of Terror Train, I love Terror Train. And I think it's Terror one Train's of the most great. underrated Jamie Lee Curtis movies that just doesn't get talked about anymore. No, and and it and, and talk about a movie that could be updated, you mm -hmm. know, or or you do a new version that's 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 wonderfully period, yeah, uh, that you lean into the period in which it was made. Oh, I love Terror Train, and I'm fun. just surprised that people just you know you read all these lists of the best horror movies, and you're not going to mm. find Terror Train on any of them, and that's that's a shame in my opinion. In my opinion. What? Yeah, I think part of that, you know, is is the end of the video store. Um, uh, it's the end of the walking down the aisles and yeah. being able to see those titles in your face. You don't see that anymore. And if you're not looking for it, yeah. you're not finding it. Now with uh, streaming, you're so overloaded with content. Yeah. Before you sit yeah. on the couch to try to watch something, you got to research what you want to watch. Yeah. You got to research and, and you're likely going to go for something newer. Yeah. You know, you're probably not. Uh, ah, you have this movie from 1981. It's uh, these kids on a train and, they're, you know, uh, you don't even know to look for. It. No, no. Uh, a, a lot so, of the you know. newer doesn't even don't even know that movie exists. Uh, yeah. But yet you take something like The Fog, which is mm. another Jamie Lee Curtis movie, which is great. Uh, but Terror Train is, you know, great as well. But fog is it maybe because it's a John Carpenter film? It's because it's because it has the Carpenter brand. Yeah, you know, and and let's face it, it has Tom Atkins. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> you know, that's uh, true. Uh, that, that I feel is the given. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Tom Atkins. I mean, 
You know, he was yeah. in Halloween. Oh God, how, listing his movies would be endless. Yeah. Is there anything that you uh, wanted to keep in My Bloody Valentine besides the the whole uh, setting of the sh- of the mine coal shaft and all that? that you definitely wanted to keep and what new elements did you want to bring into your version of my bloody valentine you know we um todd and i talked a lot about the original we were both uh, both fans of it um you know our opening in in the 3d remake is we wanted to make sort of like an encapsulized version of the original film Mm -hmm. here's 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 the an abridgment of the original film in 13 minutes um, you know, that was uh, the intent that we went in and we had lots of homages to the film as, as, as we went. Um, and we wanted to be faithful to that and not just hit new territory. Um, you know, we had, we had a version that, you know, Zane Smith's first version, um, uh, that he wrote, uh, Axel was still the killer. Axel was the, not only the killer, but he had the real Harry Warden locked up in his basement. Oh. It was, it was oh, crazy. Man. Um, and then there was a version after that where the real killer was actually Harry Warden, who had survived and just comes back. Um, and then we really started to focus on the idea of Tom as as both the killer and hero. Uh, and that really stuck and it stuck even more so once we cast Jensen Mm -hmm. Uh, um, because he embodied that so well he was somebody who who could play a guy who was a real you know likable but maybe a bit of a jerk but Mm -hmm. still still a good guy you were rooting for and had all sorts of uh, you know emotional issues and had disappeared and you know, in my mind, he was always the hero. You know, the reason he survives at the end is 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 totally because I was like, well, yeah, uh, you know, uh, Tom Hanniger's the hero. Tom Hanniger slash Harry Ward, exactly. absolutely the hero. Exactly. He walks off, and in my it, and it really was when we shot the opening sequence, which we shot near the end of the shoot, when they all leave him there. You know, uh, the Sarah Palmer, Axel, and, and and Irene get in a truck and they abandon him to Harry Ward. And at that, it was that point, it was like, oh, well, he's totally the hero. He's justified to kill all these people. <laughs> I have no problem with any of that. <laughs> um, you know, we we wanted to make something that was that that did justice to the title. Yeah. Uh, weirdly enough, and did justice to the setting and the you know keeping the mind keeping the minor. Um, you know, we felt the title really informed us of what the movie needed to be, mm-hmm. uh, uh, you know, just lean into it hard. Yeah. Uh, but we did. Now, is this the first time you had ever worked with the 3d technology? Oh God. Yeah. I had, I had never even thought of working in 3d before that. And, uh, and you know, we shot native 3d. So you're shooting with real 3d cameras. Our, our rigs were built the day before we started shooting is when they were finished almost every day on set people would say wow this has never been done before which was you know completely and utterly terrifying uh, you know because she because because we were every day was was a challenge because we only had four days on stage everything else was out in the world we shot down in a real mine for like 11 days we you know all those things were were in real spaces with cameras that were like the size of a refrigerator so it in and, and it was it was a fascinating experience to to get that you know to get that movie were there, uh, made. were there any kills that were done in a particular way to amplify the 3d experience mm, pretty much all of them mm. um certainly you know ripping tom tom atkins jaw off <laughs> was very much designed to be a 3d kill you know they, they, a couple of other writers came in and did a, a little rewrite for us but they they had a falling onto the windshield thinking that was going to be 3d and it's just kind of like and we knowing the size of the of the camera it's just like man we're never going to get that that's that's an impossible thing so the location it was weird the location almost every one of the kills was rewritten for the locations that we found mm-hmm. um certainly the scene with kevin ty you know out in the porch with the shotgun and his death with the the pickaxe hammered in the floor and his head being pushed on, on onto that. That was re, rewritten because of the location that we found. 
we figured out how to how to make the 3D kills look work in the space. The grocery store, these sort of long tunnels. That was that again was something that we encountered in that space. Uh, um, Tom Atkins ripping his jaw off was something that, you know, in talking to to Gary, uh, he came up with that gag, and the idea of being able to hook the uh, the pickaxe through through the bottom jaw and rip it off and the, the the tom atkins head he made the reset of the jaw was less than two minutes because it all fit in with magnets wow. it was it was it was wow. just it was technically an amazing thing to watch uh, how quickly that worked uh, now, yeah. do you believe that tom you know didn't realize his murderous nature and was sort of like suffering from split personality uh up until yes. right before the final reveal Yes, I, I believe he was. He and Harry had been riding um, in the same vehicle for a long time. Yeah, yeah, that makes total uh, sense. Now, yeah, Kerr Smith, Jamie King have all been prior guests of ours. I know that my bloody Valentine was shot like just outside Pittsburgh in a cold mm-hmm. night. Okay, yeah. Um, what was uh, what was your biggest challenge in shooting in the coal mines as director? Um, I personally love shooting in the coal mines because because mm. we we started shooting uh, just after after uh, Mother's Day in 2008, um, and it got really hot by the time we were shooting in the coal mines in June. Um, but when you go underground, it's always like 50 something degrees. It's a so temperature. I, I personally love shooting the coal mines. I had no, you know, some people got a little freaked out about it, you know, because there's. Um, a lot of earth above you, but uh, I I love shooting. The hardest part was lighting. The hardest part because the 3D took like three times of the light at that time. The yeah. digital cameras, the red cameras, the sensors weren't as good as they are now. So you had to have so much light. So everything took longer. You know, uh, the film I, I just finished, we we seemed to average somewhere between 60 and 70 setups a day, wow. uh, which was insane. And on Valentine, we were lucky to average 17. Wow. So every single thing you did was so key to how to, um, you know, you, you couldn't waste anything. Mm-hmm. You had to, you know, every shot was like, you know, it took a lot to get. Okay. Wow. Okay. So that that's definitely a challenge right there. Yeah. Uh in the time we have left, Dracula two thousand. I love Dracula two thousand. Uh were you surprised by the success and were you even more surprised that two sequels followed it? Um sure. I mean surprised I d I you know, Dracula two thousand is is a movie uh, more than any other thing in my career, I recut that movie in my head weekly uh i used to be daily uh used to be one of those ones where you stand in the shower and i'd recut it and sort of like hang my head it's like oh why did i do this and why didn't i do that and why did um um because there's there's so many things that aren't in it that should have been in it and there's so many things that were that we wrote that joel and i wrote specifically that didn't get in it um that it, it you know, I was thrilled that it actually found a following and people like the film and like mm-hmm. the twists and turns um, that are in it. Those all were would have been, I think, better in a slightly different version of the movie. But that's, you know, mm-hmm. so what? Um, the two sequels were really fun to do because they were, you know, made for a fraction of the budget. It's very small. Um, it, I loved working with uh, Jason Scott Lee. Uh, his character was originally written into Dracula 2000 and was written out at the request of the studio who said, Uffizi is too cool for this movie. If he's in this movie, he is cooler than anything else. (laughs) Uh, um, So when, when, after the movie came out and only a few months after they came and said, Hey, do you guys want to do a direct video sequel? Um, and we, and Joel and I were like, yeah, sure. And they said, as long as it is, has a pizza. Wow. Um, and, and so we were, we were like, absolutely. And then we pitched them the idea of doing a, a twofer, like doing the two movies as one. 
and came up with the the, the second storyline, the sort of uh, mm-hmm. Romanian storyline when we found out we were going to Romania. So, you know, the, the third movie was shot. Most of it was shot before the second. Now, there's um, a little dis- you talked you brought up yeah. the budget. There's a there was a, like a discrepancy that it was rumored that it cost two thousand cost fifty four million dollars to make. But in actuality, even, it was twenty eight million. It was 28. 28. Yeah, it was 28. That's it was a 20, big budget. I mean, that's a good yeah, budget. Yeah, it was a big budget. You know, it, it, it was also a movie that a lot of that budget went into um, push costs. You know, we originally were going to start shooting in May, and then we couldn't uh, find a Dracula uh, because we couldn't find it. And we auditioned probably over 1,000 actors for that role. Damn. Like the list of the actors who read for Dracula uh, is so long and from all over the world and uh, people who came back in and people uh, it, it, and, uh, and funnily enough, uh, Jerry Butler, Gerard Butler, he auditioned on the very first day of auditions in April of 2000 and it was great. And it was really clear that, Oh, this guy has something nobody else had certainly in that day. Mm-hmm. And but he was going off to do A Tale of the Hun uh, for USA's uh, TV movie. So he wasn't available. So the push in our search to try and find the Dracula that made everybody happy is what led us. We, we basically ran out the clock on Jerry being in Attila uh, in order to cast him being, uh, being our Dracula. Uh, <laughs> you know. Both Wes and I would talk about it frequently. We'd come back to the idea of, well, we really think it's this guy. Um, every time we came close to casting somebody else and it would fall apart or whatever. And Jerry got my phone number um, and he would call me from Lithuania. I hear you're casting so-and-so. You don't want to do that. They'll they'll be terrible. <laughs> it was, um, And he and I just hit it off. And, and, and we talked several times while he was away. And I, and I kept saying, I, I'm working on it. And then he re-auditioned when he was in Lithuania in full sort of Attila garb, <laughs> um, uh, which I think you can see online, I think, because it was on the DVD. And um, Did it have uh, to be a unanimous decision on who got to be Dracula? Um, like everyone had to agree? Uh, no, no, that's not the case. It was, there. there was some, there was some political fallout behind the scenes. Uh, that happened that allowed me to push for Jerry um, just as we were about to start shooting. Okay. Um, and then we could readjust the schedule to, to push his character being, you know, uh, being in the movie for another week. If we could get Attila to let Jerry go like four days early. Okay. So, um, but a, an event happened that was sort of a, political buster clock of the worst order um but the fallout allowed allowed me to i it gave me a card that i could play and i played it for jerry that's awesome uh uh, jerry did gerard bartler did 300 after Mm -hmm. dracula 2000 right yeah yeah Yeah. Uh, i mean that's uh with dracula as well 300 and you know he's really known for 300 yeah and... yeah i mean you think it was after dracula 2000 got up the role in in, in uh in phantom of the opera i mm-hmm. think schumacher directly saw that and i think you know he had done reign of fire he had done um uh uh timeline you know he he had you know he was he had started after you know yeah. gtk was his was his first big leading role so and then people saw and, you know once you see him it's like oh there's there's a movie star oh uh, yes yeah he's a he's a he's a yeah. professional now you've had your hand yeah. in so many franchises we're almost out of time terminator uh the purge tv show speaking of the purge i saw I just want to share this with you. I saw the recent mm. one, the new one, the Forever Purge, mm. last night. And I don't know if you've seen it yet or not, but if you haven't, I highly recommend it. It's probably one of the better ones in the franchise. It's really oh, great. Oh, it's I'll really check it out. Uh, what makes it so good is how it sort of mirrors what's going on in real life today, 
and of course puts the whole purge element into it it's scary mm. just because of that and it's great storytelling and i know you're a true horror fan and i think you would appreciate it so when you get a chance watch yeah, the forever I'll purge I'll, I'll, I'll go see it uh within the next week uh, i'm certainly yeah. wanting to see yeah. it I, I loved working on the tv series it was um it was a fun world to step into. Um, uh, I, I think in all the things I've done, my episode of The Purge has the highest body count, and especially in like 44 <laughs> minutes. I think we killed like, like 30 some odd people. It was pretty insane. That is pretty insane. Patrick, we're out of time. Thank you so much. This has been one of the funnest hours I've had. It's been an absolute delight talking to you. We love, I loved hearing all the stories you have to share, and I think our audience loved it as well. Thank you so much for coming. Thank on you, show. John. This has been—I really enjoyed it. I, I had a great time chatting with you. So thank you very much. It's been awesome. Any final? I mean, you said you're working on a project. You can you share anything with it? Yeah, I, I, I just finished uh, shooting a movie with uh, Bailey Madison and Jerry O'Connell, okay. uh, sort of a wow. horror suspense thriller that's really fun. Uh, okay. Very sort of. Uh, turned out to be a crazy little movie and 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 uh, we're just in cutting right now and and uh, gary tunnicliffe was back on board and, and created much mayhem that's awesome we'll be looking out for it thank you so much patrick my executive thank producer brother has been messaging me to make sure i say hello on behalf of him to you he's a big fan of well, yours as well please say hello back so hello from yeah. my brother marco and our executive producer i want to thank patrick for joining us guys thank you so much for tuning in uh we'll be back again tomorrow and until then on behalf of patrick and myself stay safe and always stay walking good night <laughs>